here's an article by D. Michael Quinn, The Culture of Violence in Joseph Smith's Mormonism. Now, D. Michael Quinn is an excommunicated Mormon scholar. He was also one of the early scholars to write the books about that strange council of 50 that no one knew about until Michael Quinn and his mentor decided to publicize it. He was the author of the book that was quite a groundbreaking book about Joseph Smith and the Smith family's relationship with folk magic, as he called it. Other authors, such as Peter Lavenda, has called it simple ceremonial magic that is based on grimoires and magical formulations in, uh, embedded in the grimoires of the day. Early Mormonism and Magic Worldview, Quinn points out that first published version of the Revelation was done by dousing activities, and that Oliver Cowdery had said that the dousing rod, referred to as the rod of nature, would serve as the means of receiving divine revelation. Other claims, including Smith's purported involvement in astrology, are less supported by evidence. The Wikipedia article also states, some historians, both within and without the faith, consider the book an important contribution in understanding early Mormonism, but others have criticized the book as relying too heavily on environmental parallels without a proven connection to Smith's ideas. Again, based on total hearsay of Smith's contemporaries proved to be Smith's enemies. So it's like going to a completely biased source and say, did you like Joseph Smith? And they say, well, no. Well, give me a reason. Oh, he was a he was a con man. He was this. And who you're talking to are the actual con men. That old saying, always blame others for the things that you are doing or accuse others for the crimes you are committing. That's an age-old political and criminal tactic. Goes back to Caesar. Anyway, they say, they criticize, they criticize Quinn's research because it relies too heavily on E.B. Howe and Hurlbut affidavits, which again, Dan Bogle relies on almost exclusively on Eber Howe, who was a detractor and did a smear book on Joseph Smith during the time Joseph Smith was leading the Mormon church. This has, again, been reused heavily by Kathleen Kimball Melanarchos on her book, Accusing Smith Family of Engaging in Counterfeit, of which there is no direct evidence and absolutely no indirect or circumstantial evidence that is reliable and could be admitted in court through some sort of hearsay exception. None. And yet they just use it as if it's truth. If you repeat a lie, and if you repeat the big lie enough, the people will believe it. And this has been how the Mormons have gotten away with their lies since Brigham Young. Okay, Smith's ideas and behaviors that it accepts at face value disputed how Hurlbut affidavits about Smith's reputation and the behavior in the New York and late 19th century newspaper account of money digging agreement involving Smith and his father. William J. Hamlin states in his review of the book that the fact that Quinn could not discover a single primary source written by a Latter-day Saint that makes any positive statement about magic is hardly dissuasive to a historian of Quinn's inventive capacity. In other words, he's being ironic there. <laughs> he says that Quinn does not have one positive statement contemporary coming from Joseph Smith himself, which connects him to magic. And I come across this article by Michael Quinn. Michael Quinn still claims that he is a believing Latter-day Saint. Well, I don't know which church he believes in, because obviously everything he writes is very critical of Joseph Smith and based on very little evidence. So in this article, he quotes how Joseph Smith was a very violent man, opposite of Smith's reputation with everybody during the day that knew him. Smith was known to be jovial, to be lighthearted, and to be a forgiving, compassionate man. And that was even claimed by John D. Lee that he never saw Joseph Smith harm anybody. And in fact, Joseph Smith was law abiding, contrary to Brigham Young, who was a killer, according to John D. Lee, ordered people to kill witnesses to his crimes, Brigham Young's crimes. And John D. Lee goes through and cites four different killings, which Brigham Young ordered. And they were very mafia style type of killings. For example, they would take people out in a field, say that there's whiskey in a pre-dug grave for the person and tell the person to go grab the whiskey out of the hole. And once he did, they would kill him with their picks and axes and then bury him. That is the type of mafia style killing that started in Nauvoo, according to John D. Lee, after the death of Joseph Smith. John D. Lee never witnessed anything like that during Joseph Smith's period of leadership. But here, Michael Quinn goes to great lengths 
only using the affidavits that smeared Joseph Smith at the time by the E.B. Howe, Smith was a very violent man. In March in 1832, a mob broke into the homes of Smith and the president and his counselor sitting Rignard in Hiram, Ohio. The mob dragged the two out of their beds and attempted to poison Smith, nearly castrated him. Now the church never relates the fact that they were tarred and feathered to the fact that Joseph Smith was a known abolitionist. Abolitionists were being tarred and feathered and targeted during this period of time. Even my cousin, John Joliffe, his legal office in Ohio was burned down by these mobocrats, pro-slavery. Joseph Smith was anti-slavery, and so was my cousin, John Joliffe. And this is why there was so much violence and burning going on. But this is never stated by the Mormon church. They only say, oh, it's because of his beliefs. Well, yes, his beliefs that were anti-slavery. So then we go down here. It's difficult to explain in satisfactory human terms how Joseph Smith could manifest such Quaker-like pacifism in his personal responses to this incident, and yet for lesser provocations, be very violent, he says. Now again, for some reason, Kathleen Melanakos, Kimball, D. Michael Quinn also want to connect the Smith's religion to Quakerism. It was not Quakerism, and it wasn't Calvinism. In fact, Smith clearly explains his form of Christianity in uh, Lucy Max Smith's autobiography in a letter that he writes to his uncle. He claims that they are practicing a new covenant of Christianity. The new covenant, but the new covenant, which was the type of Mormonism I was taught for some reason, and when I talk to other Mormons, they don't remember this new covenant type of religion. The new covenant religion states the old Mosaic law it was fulfilled and goes away. That all that vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, and all that war that went on in the Old Testament no longer is required of any Christian. And that the Sermon on the Mount Christianity now is the new covenant from the Lord. And if you practice those concepts within the Sermon on the Mount, that is what you need to do to be a Christian within a new covenant tradition. It's not Quakerism and it's not Cal um, Calvinism, Puritanism, which are old Testament forms of religion based on vengeance. Quakers were despised by Lucy Smith and the New Englanders at the time. So were the Puritans. Written in many biographies, the New Englanders felt that these were carpetbaggers sent over by the British oligarchs. They lent money at high interest rates. And in fact, when you didn't pay it, it would take your property and throw you in jail. And there's an incident where an old Quaker comes to Lucy Smith's house and throws Joseph Smith and throws Joseph Smith Sr. in jail for a $50 note that he had purchased off someone else. And that you can you can have a loan with someone that's a friend who will give you more time. But once that loan is purchased like by this Quaker, he came and demanded full payment and then threw Joseph Smith in jail. Now Lucy Smith put this in her autobiography to show how despised these Quaker like people were. They were not Quakers and they were not Puritans. Puritans were equally despised. And he just restates, again, the gossip that was made by all these people that were conspiring against the Mormon movement. And he claims that Smith somehow knew about the Danite organization. John D. Lee says that never once did he ever see Joseph Smith be involved with any of the murderous activities of the Danites and Brigham Young, that all this violence occurred after Smith's death. The first time this Council 50 is revealed is through Michael Quinn's books, and he suddenly comes out with this whole idea that Smith had the secret kingdom that he invented during the time of Nauvoo. Of course, John D. Lee had heard rumors of it, and Lucy Mack Smith refers to this council as not being part of the Mormon church, but being part of the Higbees, the Fosters, the, the John C. Bennett's, and, and the all enemies of Joseph Smith. And of course, Joseph Smith in 1842 had already named his enemies. They were Orson Hyde. Orson Pratt, Farley P. Pratt, and John C. Bennett. And then in the Nauvoo minutes of June of 1844, he continues to name Higby's Fosters and the William Laws, the Wilson Laws as his arch enemies, including the Joseph H. Jackson's plot to kill the entire Hiram Smith family, which the church has never disclosed. Also, the fact that these parties we're setting up the counterfeiting in Nauvoo, selling drinks, which there was no licenses. Now I'm going to show you how these Mormon documents contradict each other. And is my theory at this point, these Mormon documents have been 
completely invented by Utah Mormon Church, and it started under the auspices of the church historian who is Leonard Arrington. Now, of course, Leonard Arrington is praised as one of the most brilliant Mormon scholars, that he had revolutionized the works of the Mormon Church, and he spent 10 years in the archives with his research assistants, bringing him about all this new information. And one of the, the brilliant things that they brought forward was this suddenly appearing out of nowhere, the Council of 50 Minutes, the minutes of these council meetings in which Joseph Smith was in attendance. And suddenly Joseph Smith is starting to use all this fiery language, which the language in the rhetoric is not Joseph Smith's rhetoric. We've got examples of Joseph Smith's rhetoric, in it, such as Lucy Max Smith wrote in, included a letter of Joseph Smith to his uncle, claiming that they were a New Covenant Christian. Christian. This rhetoric can be traced to several authors. Most of the authors are the, from the Scottish Enlightenment and from the Spencer family in England. And the Spencer family are also related to George Washington, who also is a Mason. George Washington was financed by the Spencers, came over here, conquered the U.S. and all, <laughs> introduced the central banking system, which we have been enslaved with ever since. Yes, George Washington now in every state capital is, appears as a Roman god. And in the Capitol building in Washington, D.C., they call it the apotheosis, the apotheosis of George Washington, in which he is going up to the heavens and becoming a god. And this is the Brigham Young idea of Mormonism. Man may become a god, just like the Masons teach. Okay, this is not Joseph Smith's teachings. All of, it is my theory that all of these documents can be identified as being fraudulent and not arising from the sources that they claim to be. And in fact, on their face, these uh, Council of 50 Minutes show that they were reconstructed from the diaries of William Clayton. Supposedly, supposedly, yes. So these Council of 50 Minutes that appear on the Mormon website would not be admissible in court because the provenance, there's no exception that would allow these Council of 50 Minutes to be admitted, and especially when there are no direct, no direct evidence happening at the time that this council even existed. Okay, so who do, does the Mormon Church promote? Well, it promotes how wonderful Leonard Arrington is. And of course, Leonard Arrington has all these illustrious universities that he attended. The University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, then he began to teach Utah State Agriculture, and then just happened to be published by Harvard the University, Harvard, Yale, they go to Harvard or Yale, you know, they're corrupt. Oh, and a Fulbright professorship at the University of Genoa, Italy, fascist Italy, right during the time of Gladio. Okay, and then he also served in North Africa in a prisoner of war camps and in the statistics office, in which probably they kept statistics on everybody that was genocided during World War II by the Italians. I have no proof of that. But these connections, they're called links. They certainly can lead to other documents that probably would tend to prove or tend not to. I'm just finding this all ironic. Just interesting enough that Arrington comes out of 10 years of working in the archives with all these new documents that no one has ever seen, including the Council of 50. Funny here, but let's go back to the article by Michael Quinn in which he thrashes once again Joseph Smith, even though he claims he loves Joseph Smith. Okay, in June, Smith instructed the Nauvoo Mormons about the next stage of violence against their enemies. He warned what would happen if Missouri continues her warfare and to issue her writs against me. If they don't let me alone, I will make war. And of course, he has a footnote for that. Well, this has never reported any documents that were current at the time or any witnesses of Joseph Smith. And in fact, the Nauvoo City Council suggests otherwise. So does, so does the Relief Society minutes counter that. See, the Mormon documents within themselves show that they're not contemporaneously produced documents. They were written and altered long after Smith's death, altered multiple times, so they would not be allowed in court. But here, Quinn goes out of his way to elicit this information that is uncharacteristic of Joseph Smith. He says, who, again, is a new covenant, Sermon on the Mount, peaceful prophet, he states, in March of 1843, Joseph Smith told the Nauvoo City Council that he was opposed to hanging. If a man kill another, shoot him or cut his throat, blood atonement again. This was not introduced until after Smith's death. The blood atonement was suddenly the Brigham Young thing that he 
he taught his Adana that if his instructions were not followed to the letter, that that person who disobeyed would be killed by having his throat cut. That was Brigham Young, not Joseph Smith. If a man kill another, I would shoot him or cut his throat, spilling the blood on the ground and let the smoke thereof ascend up to God. If I ever have the privilege of making a law on this point, I will have it so. And of course, it wasn't Joseph Smith that had it so, it was Brigham Young. And this ritual is documented of that you spill the blood on the ground, you light it up and the smoke rises. And what occurs during that period of time is it sends up the negative field ions from the smoke that's just incinerated blood plasma creates an electromagnetic image in the air in the form of a baphomet or any number of the 72 demons that are outlined in the Goetia of Solomon. Now, these electromagnetic images that appear from blood being burned or incinerated are what you call the wrinkles in the electromagnetic field that occurred when the Earth's fell from its axis in the last catastrophe happening around 1500 BC. The Romans called this the kilopa, or uncreated beings within the electromagnetic field that can invade the human electromagnetic field of the human and cause it to be distorted, creating not only brain damage within the brain, I mean, you first create the brain damage, and then this electromagnetic images and fields can invade a person with brain damage because there's no filter to filter out this, what you call chaos, or it's called noise in electromagnetic field. And this is what is caused by well, schizophrenia when people start hearing command voices. It's really all this noise that is we're swimming in, but the human brain, if it is not brain damage, has a filter, much like a radio dial that is able to dial in the right radio frequency. But if the brain is damaged as when it occurs in early child abuse up to the three years of age, that ruins this filter and you have all sorts of schizophrenia occurring, mostly in the European continent and the European Western cultures. There is very little schizophrenia reported in the Eastern cultures until these Eastern cultures were invaded by the Western cultures, I mean, out of the Caucasus and introduced to this early form of child abuse causing brain damage and creating basically very aggressive warlike genocidal people that we see now being restated by Brigham Young, which is basically the Carthaginian ritual of burning, of killing your firstborn child and then offering it up as a holocaust to your god, which is the god of war. So here we have the blood atonement, which John D. Lee said was introduced by Brigham Young, not Joseph Smith, but suddenly they have these documents that came out of the Leonard Arrington period of 10 years of working in the archives. Suddenly we have all these documents which go completely against the actual history of people that knew Joseph Smith. And so they're just trying to smear Joseph Smith's reputation and sue documents that are unreliable and can be proved by any forensic historian looking at the documents on the Mormon, on the Joseph Smith papers website would be able to tell without hesitation that the provenance and the origin could not be reliable or could not be traceable and therefore would not be admissible as evidence in court. 